Rita says the plan was to make Matt a victim, adding that... I'm the Orange Ranger, and welcome to another comically long review. Last time, these brand new Power Rangers were dealing for the first time with being close to other people who didn't know they were Rangers when it was time to morph. Were they able to slip away and get the job done? And, you know, is Kimberly's boyfriend Matt alive? Let's find out by taking a look at Go Go Power Rangers, issues number four, five, and six. The alternate covers focus on Billy. Well, besides the really cute fried pie variant, the unmorphed rangers with their anime looking dinosaurs. And I really love this Back to the Future poster variant with him. Classic movie posters redone as covers for this have been going since the beginning, and I think they've all been good. This is just one that really stood out to me. The regular cover, which this was actually my first time seeing because I got the paper doll variant, is actually pretty awesome. The ranger standing below a giant lizard monster, about to get flattened like... Oh, you can eat pancakes for $4.99. Four months before arrival day, Kim is having dinner with her parents at a really upscale restaurant. You know, I never got the impression that Angel Grove had those kinds of places. Even when Zack took Angela out that one time, it was kind of an outside cafe sort of place. Any dang way, as we've seen, Kim's parents weren't exactly getting along at this point in time. The family had just moved to Angel Grove from Los Angeles, which in itself is funny because I always thought that Angel Grove was something of an analog for Los Angeles, and now I'm kind of wondering where exactly Angel Grove is supposed to be. Space is warped and time is bendable. They're arguing about where Kim will go to school. Her dad wanting her to attend a private Catholic school. Her mom saying Kim isn't even Catholic and should just attend the public schools, though the schools were better in Los Angeles and yada yada. <laughs> Kim tries to get them to stop fighting, but they ignore her. So she decides the best thing to do is to make a scene of her own, apparently. She calls over to a nearby waiter, saying the salad she ordered is all wrong. It was supposed to have green olives and the dressing and etc, etc. The waiter, or rather a busboy, is Zach. He says this and that he doesn't even think that they have green olives. Kim's dad jumps to her defense, saying he doesn't appreciate Zack's tone. And to be fair, Zack does backtalk a little bit, though he's not rude about it. The manager sees the situation and comes over, and her parents are snobby about it. The manager is your classic snotty dude working in a high-end place, firing Zack right in front of them and then asking how he can make it right. Kim begs him not to do that, saying it's just a salad, but the manager says the manner is settled. Back to the present, Kim is still with Matt, who weakly asks if he got the monster, so he's as okay as can be expected. Kim gives the monster, who says, apparently his name, Flog, the crazy eyes, and goes to morph, but Zack jumps in morphed and knocks Flog away. Zack trash talks him a little and then asks someone if they're ready. Vlog gets shot a bunch, and Trini and Billy show up from absolutely nowhere, commenting on how much they love their blade blasters, and Billy references his play pretend past. Zack checks on Matt and Kim, pretending not to know Kim since Matt is semi-conscious. Kim says he needs to go to the hospital, and Zack says someone can take him while she slips away. To safety, you know. But Kim is clear that she's not leaving his side. Zack says that's fine, but basically, you know, boy, it sure would be nice if the Pink Ranger were around, huh? Jason is still stuck in the storefront. He tries to leave, saying he has to help his friends. But Bulk jumps up, saying he's got a friend out there, too. Principal Kaplan vetoes either of them leaving until it's safe. Ernie comforts Jason, saying that he's sure everyone's fine, especially since the Rangers are out there. Trini suggests teleporting Jason out in order to get his help, but Zack points out that he's surrounded by other people and that would give away his identity. Besides, Zack can throw cars, apparently. 
Billy handles a group of nearby putties when he hears someone screaming for help, trapped. He races over to free them and finds... Skull. Skull is grateful, of course, but then asks if he can hang out with the rangers sometime, since he and his friend Bulk are just like them. Billy can't resist the chance to call Skull out, saying the rangers can see everything. Meanwhile, Kim knows that the rangers need her help and asks someone nearby to get Matt to a hospital. However, the person she asked is Sassy, the putty shapeshifter. This was apparently part of Rita's plan as Finster runs up and says her plan is working. He wants to recall Flog, the distraction complete, but Rita says he's still got a job to do. She throws her wand to make Flog grow. Finster points out that the rangers will just destroy him, but Rita says that's the way it is. Each monster, even if it doesn't win, is a wound that gets closer to the killing blow. Flog grows, and the rangers know they can't form the Megazord without Jason. They can't even fight it here in the city, but conveniently enough, it leaves. Alpha says it's heading for a nearby power plant, and the rangers call their zords. Awesome single-page spread of the four zords showing up. What is it with these comics and doing things that would make awesome posters if not for a ranger being missing? The rangers talk through a battle plan, but they didn't count on the monster hitting them with electricity it had absorbed. Their controls get locked up, and Trini calls Alpha for help. Kim flies over, saying she's got this, but the monster... farts a smokescreen, the comic's own words, what is this, ninja steel? Anyway, she tries to climb out of it, but her wing gets hit and she can't come back around. Zordon tells the rangers to retreat, they need the Megazord to take this thing down. They refuse, though, since it can really hurt the city from where it is. Zack tells Billy to shoot one of the pylons, knocking out power to that section of the city. He does, and we see that the power's gone out at the store where Jason is. The principal asks for a flashlight, but nobody responds. Billy Zord is running from the monster, but gets grabbed. But then, Jason comes to the rescue in the T-Rex Zord. Yep, all part of the plan. Zack had Billy knock out the power, knowing that would let Jason slip out in the dark. The Rangers form the Megazord in a full-page spread, well, they do tuck in another frame on the bottom, that would make an excellent poster. The Rangers are not screwing around with this thing. They cut off one of its tentacles, and we even get to see blood spraying from the stump. What is this, Jew Ranger footage? It starts to get dark, and Jason says he was counting on that, since presumably the Zord's mechanical vision would have the advantage. And apparently it did. We get two panels of solid black, and then we see the monster dead on the ground, and the Rangers have won. The sky clears, so I guess it wasn't getting dark, it was just the smoke screen. Anyway, Kim would love to leave the corpse of the monster on Rita's doorstep as a message, but Billy says Flog was the message. He's picked up what Rita was putting down earlier. One giant monster attack could have been an isolated incident. Two? That's life in Angel Grove now, and people are going to head for the hills. Or will they? The rangers head to the juice bar to meet Jason, expecting to find it deserted, but it's hopping. What do the kids say? It's lit? Anyway, why are all these kids so happy and, well, so there? Because of the Power Rangers, of course. And to make it better, Ernie's found five new volunteers to teach classes at the Youth Center. The Rangers are thrilled, which is great, because they are the volunteers. Jason pitches this very wisely. Teaching classes gives them access and an excuse to train at the Youth Center and gives people around them an outlet, a way to stay happy. Trini's make good for missing her mom's birthday is pretty good, actually. Her mom says that she knows Trini's busy, she didn't have to get her anything, etc., etc., classic mom stuff. Trini got her mom a rock, but not just any rock. You remember the rock garden that Trini talked about with her mom and her mother? Her mom said that there was a rock in the center of that that had family written on it in Korean. Trini went and got that rock and gave it to her mother. She can't believe it, wondering how Trini could have even pulled this off. I mean, it's not like she could have just flown over to Korea and picked it up. Absolutely right. I mean, supposing that Trini were some kind of 
superhero with access to the kind of technology that would allow her to do something like this, surely doing something like this would be considered using those powers for personal gain, right? Listen, I understand complaining about that sounds insensitive isn't necessarily the right word, picky? But remember just a few issues ago, Zordon said the rules of the ranger basically predate him and implied that you can't just get a green light to get a pleasure flight to Korea to pick up a rock. If the rules are so hard and fast that the rangers can't inform their families about who they are, this kind of thing definitely shouldn't fly. Meanwhile, Zack is in the command center and asking Zordon a pretty big question. Why wasn't he picked to be the Red Ranger? When they went to the moon, Jason played Glory Hound going after Rita Solo. And when given a chance to leave the team with Jason stuck, he led them against Flog and showed himself strong. Zordon wouldn't admit this normally, but Zack's leadership did warrant at least this explanation. Each ranger was selected with a specific set of criteria. Jason, as we saw admit to Ernie, used to use his strength to torment others, and now works every day to make amends for that. He would never allow anyone to go down the wrong path, making him the choice to be leader. Just because Zack doesn't lead doesn't mean he's not important. And in fact, a good team should be full of people who can take the lead at any given time. He goes to visit Matt and Kim has slept at his side. She wakes up when Zack comes in and says the doctors think Matt might be in a coma. But when Zack comes in, Matt wakes up. The two assure him that the world is safe and ask how he's doing. He says he got punched in the face by a monster, but hey, two of his favorite faces were watching him when he woke up. But hmm, this last word balloon is purple. Coloring error? Afraid not. Rita has taken the real Matt prisoner and is speaking through whatever's in the hospital. This is probably the best issue of GoGo Power Rangers thus far. It really feels like the characters are kind of finding their footing, and I love seeing the Rangers figure out simple situations that we've come to take for granted. Things like slipping away from a situation so they can morph, or using their blade blasters. Also, Zack's conversation with Zordon at the end is even better when you remember the one that they had in issue 5 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers after Rita offered Zack the Green Ranger powers. Zack specifically mentions at that point that he's not interested in leading the team. A nice thing about prequels is if you write them well, you have the ability to demonstrate character growth even though it's kind of cheating because the story's being told in reverse. The only real misstep in this issue to me is that scene with Trini and her mother. Was it heartwarming? Yes, it was cute and it was nice and it was sweet and all that. But clearly Trini used her powers in some aspect to get that rock for her mother, and after the series made such a big deal about the rules of the ranger applying to something vital like letting their families know that they're superheroes, it's just tough for me to let it slide that Trini apparently teleported to Korea to get her mother a rock. Now, you can argue that teleportation is something that Billy came up with and not necessarily an aspect of their powers, even though Alpha can teleport them from the command center, but at the very least, it's a mixed message. Overall, this just feels like a very strong issue and where they finally started to figure out the feeling of this series. Issue number four gets a 4.5 out of 5. The six covers for issue five mainly focus on Kim, and there's two I'd like to talk about briefly. With the paper doll variant here, I just kind of love that Kim's ponytail is detachable. It lets you put the helmet over her head and not have a weird ponytail sticking out of it. The second is a recurring cover series that I haven't mentioned yet, the Rangers getting things from their lockers. This is a fine cover, but my roving eye noticed a weird detail here. Notice that this wall of the locker is behind Kimberly's shoulder. That kind of means that Kim is standing inside of her locker. I mean, like, you could close the door behind her. I get that that's sort of a thing. I mean, how long have bullies been locking kids inside lockers? But it still just seems like it's a little big. I mean, heck, she's got her entire gymnastics duffel bag inside there, too. That thing's roomy. The main cover features a situation that would naturally happen for the Rangers and addresses a factor in this story thus far. There's news of a monster attack on TV, but the Rangers are looking at their communicators, which must have just beeped, and Matt notices this. 
Seems like in every new issue, we start further and further in the past. Well, we can't push it back too much farther than this, just a little over 10,000 years ago, meaning just before Rita was imprisoned by Zordon, Rita is conquering another world, the home of the Breel. They're going to come up later over in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. One of Rita's warriors describes how he fought the Breel High Chieftain, but the warrior surrendered in exchange for the life of his soldiers. Being evil conquerors, the warrior, whom Rita calls Montar, slaughtered the man and presents his helmet as a trophy for Rita. Rita talks about how Lord Zed has assigned her with conquering basically everything she can, and Montar eagerly volunteers to help, talking about how they will spread fear, so worlds can be basically defeated before they even get to them. I think he showed a little too much ambition. Rita sneers at him, and as she turns to lead her to the Briel Castle, Rita kills him, calling it a pity. To be honest, I don't really get this. He didn't really show that much ambition to overthrow her. It's just as possible that he was too in line with the plan of Lord Zed to conquer these worlds instead of Rita getting them herself. I get it. I don't get it. Meanwhile, we get a fun sequence that we hardly if ever see from the television show. Zord training. Trini and Jason are taking on the other three, and while the greater numbers get the upper hand at first, Jason and Trini come back, perhaps again reflecting the fact that they've had greater time training, and win. Zordon calls it, telling the rangers basically their brains are hardwired into the Zords when they pilot them, and they have capabilities that they haven't even discovered yet. For example, Billy could have saved Zack by using the Triceratops horn chains, which Billy didn't even know were a thing. Zack asks what his Zord can do, and Zordon basically goes all Udana, saying these answers will come with time and training. There's something of a disconnect here, though. This isn't something like being able to pilot the Zords more efficiently or unlocking abilities in them like friggin' Gosei. Zordon tells Billy a capability of his Zord that he didn't know it had. This is instruction manual stuff here, and withholding this information is just Zordon being classic what you need, when you need it, Zordon. Turns out that their snowy battlefield was in the pocket dimension, though I guess the space containing the pocket dimension, if that makes any sense, is big enough to hold the Zords because they're there when the Rangers leave it. Eh, maybe this is just actually where the Zords are stored and the whole volcano jungle thing we saw on the show was for show. Being honest, the conversation the Rangers have as they demorph and leave their Zords is a little awkward and hard to follow, but basically it seems like the Rangers are complaining that their Zords can't just tell them what they can do, seeing as they're really busy besides having to train. At school, Jason notices that the homecoming dance is a week away, and Zack reveals that he found an invitation from a secret admirer in his locker. A quite intelligent one, as it turns out. I am vital yet insignificant, outgoing but lonely, both eccentric and typical. And by the by, the identity of this admirer is contained in that clue right there. Figure it out! Trini asks Jason if he's taking anyone, and he says sure. Just as soon as the Power Rangers defeat all evil and the world is totally safe. Might want to take a rain check on that. Bulk and Skull then approach, Bulk announcing that he's running for Homecoming King. The Rangers are surprised, even pointing out that Bulk is a junior, which would mean that he's older than the Rangers, though I guess that kind of fits, since by the time the Rangers graduated during Turbo, Bulk and Skull already had jobs. But Bulk says the bylaws state that a junior can run as long as they get 50 signatures from their graduating class. Jason pointedly stares down the petition and does not sign it, but both Zack and Trini do, the latter to Jason's noticeable surprise. Meanwhile, Billy is at home and has received a recruiting care package from Promethea, a VR headset along with a geothermal hoodie and some energy bars. Billy sort of plays everything off, saying that even if he bombs the interview, he's got some cool swag. His dad decides to take the chance to talk to his son about this opportunity, and you may have already noticed something very interesting. 
Yes, Billy's dad is very clearly modeled after David Yost, the actor who played Billy on the TV show. I find that a very nice touch, and what's funny about all this is while, in a manner of speaking, Yost is playing Billy's dad, his character is the complete opposite. Mr. Cranston says that his mother is very proud of him, and while he was hoping for a star quarterback for a son, he's learned to love math as well. Billy's a good kid and deserves this kind of opportunity and the life that it would provide for him. So he needs to give this chance everything he's got. Everything. Matt enters the juice bar and right off the bat, Kim notices something is different. He's walking differently, but she chalks it up to him having been thrown through a building. She says they don't have to do the whole homecoming thing this year if he's not up to it, but he gets all suave and says he's just fine. The other rangers break up the near kiss, happy that Matt is back, and asks how he's doing. He sort of slips up a little bit, saying he's missed everything, even school, but then backtracks on that and says he's okay. The football coach has even cleared him to play against Stone Canyon. That worries Jason and Kim, since they're known to be pretty brutal. But they haven't faced off against a shape-shifting putty before. Very subtle has crushed this field and has won it by five. Rita's forces are observing the rangers through the matte putty, and Goldar makes some funny comments about this strange process of choosing royalty. Rita is concerned that the shapeshifter keeps slipping up, Finster saying that this is a new type of monster, a wet mold creature that is learning and adjusting on the fly. Finster preaches time and guidance, but Rita instead wants... Input. My input! Okay, no Squat and Babu take Matt from the wall he was stuck to and lead him to a prison area, passing by the main area of the palace that shows him that he's in space. Well, I mean, on the moon, but technically speaking, sure, you're in space. They lead him to Rita, who wants to know everything about him. He tells off the warlock Madonna, but then she casts a spell, changing her appearance to look like Kimberly. There must have been some other type of magic involved, too, because despite seeing Rita change right in front of him, he is convinced that this is, in fact, Kimberly telling her to run. Rita says that, well, Rita is trying to get any secrets she can about their group, so Matt should tell her, her being Kim, uh, anything he knows. Again, he seems magically convinced, agreeing to fess up, even if he's reluctant. Jason is training Matt at the juice bar, Matt showing surprising prowess for the fighting. In the locker room afterwards, Matt says that after fighting a monster, he decided that learning how to fight wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea. He's got a lot on his mind right now and can use Jason to help with something else, this whole homecoming thing. He asks if Jason's going to ask Trini since she's had a crush on him for forever. Jason was completely unaware of this, totally surprised by the revelation. He says he'll talk to her, but Matt suggests a different approach. He says if Jason's not sure how he feels about her, he should probably keep her at a distance until he knows so he doesn't unintentionally hurt her. He says that's wise advice and thanks Matt for being a good friend. Thank you for being a friend. Quick aside to Bulk and Skull as they continue the Homecoming King efforts. Bulk has sought out Marlowe, queen of the popular girls. He knows that she's a shoe in for queen, so if they go together, he can win king. Marlowe makes it very clear that she has waited her entire life to be homecoming queen, and she's not going to share the moment with a joke like Bulk. If you run, I'll make your life more of a hell than it already is, okay? One of her friends stays back a second to insist that she's being serious and begs him not to run. Bulk doesn't seem concerned, just commenting that Marlowe smelled nice. More Zord training for the Rangers as they take their Zords through a jungle environment. It's hide-and-seek this time as they look for Jason in the T-Rex. Kim asks about finding Billy a date for the dance, though Billy says he's not going since there's an MST3K marathon the same night. Sorry about this, everyone. It's my fault. Sorry. Sorry. Couldn't resist. Anyway, Jason pops out from behind some trees or something and uses a sonic roar, knocking the other Zords away and leaving him one-on-one -on -one with Billy. He says the exercise is over. And as the Rangers dismount, Jason tells his team off. 
Kim's playing matchmaker, Billy's smelling the leaves, and nobody's focusing, treating this like a big game. Trini stands up for them, saying these things just happen, but Jason stands firm. The failure of one of them is the failure of all of them. They may have just been friends before, but now they are a team. He says that Zordon was right in saying that some of them have embraced this, but others haven't which must have been a conversation that they had privately because I don't exactly remember Zordon having said that. But anyway, Jason says if they don't stay diligent, someone they care about could get hurt. The comic demonstrates this by showing us Matt in prison by Rita. Jason says the fate of the world is more important than being their friend, so if he has to push them harder, so be it. I wouldn't call issue number five a step back, per se. It's just more that it settles back in to do a whole bunch more world building to set up the next arc of the series. It is a whole bunch of setup. The Zord training and Jason moving into stronger leadership, Putty Matt and starting to learn the Ranger secrets to use them against them, and even the whole bulk for king thing. Ooh, there's an idea for a slogan. Bulk king up? And Marlowe plotting to ruin his life for it. We've started a whole bunch of new story threads. Now, we just have to sew them together. Issue number five gets a four out of five. Five covers for issue six, with three of them featuring bulk. The paper doll variant also has a detachable ponytail, presumably so you can put his burger Burgersaurus ranger form over it, or his leather helmet here. Also, with the locker variant here, bulk has his hand on the door, meaning that may have actually been the door behind Kimberly on her cover. It still doesn't really explain fitting the duffel bag inside, but hey. The main cover features the rangers scaling down the walls of Rita's palace since they're looking down, so they're not climbing up, so I don't know. Trini is also clinging to Jason, suggesting she might be injured. Thinking about it, this cover really doesn't reference to anything in the story, and I'm not familiar with anything else it might be homaging. Well, I said we couldn't go any further back, so let's go forward. Barely. Still 10,000 years ago, just a little bit later than last time, Rita is continuing her campaign of conquest and honestly is growing bored of it. It's always the same routine. Conquer a world, they offer a bounty to try to get her to spare them. The cycle gets broken when the humble bounty of one couple gets her attention. Their child. Rita asks why she'd want a baby, and the parents claim that the child is strong and smart. Her mother asks the baby to do a trick with berries, but he just throws them back at her, being a baby. They come clean, the kid's a moron just like his dad, but he's all that they have to give. Rita asks if they'd willingly give up their own child to save their lives, and they say yes, freely. Now, Rita may be evil, but she at least has standards ordering them taken away. Well, you're a squat little thing, aren't you? 16 days after arrival day, Jason is approaching Trini, rehearsing a speech about how he's been weird lately because he heard a rumor that she has a crush on him. But when he gets to her, he freezes up and can only say they have practice at seven. In the gym, Zack is with Kim and Billy trying to figure out his secret admirer. Kim and Zack rifle through all the usual suspects, but everyone has other dates or other arrangements. Billy, the smart one, goes back to the note and pieces it right together. Vital, insignificant, ordinary, lonely, eccentric, typical. V-I-O-L-E-T. Violet. That would be Violet Arius, and I have to admit that this would have more of an impact if we had any clue who that was. They discuss her, a wallflower-looking girl who is as intelligent as Billy. Zack says he'll talk to her, but now that the mystery is solved, some of the allure is gone. Meanwhile, Bulk goes on stage at the cafeteria, and by the way, if you think it's weird for a cafeteria to have a stage, some of my schools did. It gives you a place to have assemblies when you don't have an auditorium and announces that any students in his class that sign his petition will get free copyright violating Power Rangers t-shirts. Ooh, Bulk, be careful. One day you're gonna start a YouTube channel and you don't even wanna mess around with copyrighted stuff. You will lose your monetization like that. Trust me, I would know. In the back of the crowd, Marlowe tells her cronies that they saw her warn Bulk, 
So what happens next is not her fault. Matt has taken his family to a drive-in movie, wanting some family time and getting popcorn. His little sister points out this is weird since he hates family time and popcorn. He says he was told everyone loves popcorn, but the weirdness of that statement is interrupted by Goldar attacking with putties. Zordon calls the rangers to battle, saying he'll teleport them straight there. However, Billy is not with them. Billy is at his Promethea interview. The interviewer says he's exceptional, but so are all their other candidates. He goes to leave. She knows that he's nervous, but just wants to know why he thinks he'd be good there. He says he's not sure that he does. As the other rangers go into battle, Billy gives a speech about how things seem so simple for his friends, just act and react, but he analyzes everything and that introduces some fear. Billy can see how every single piece fits into everything, except himself. If Promethea can help him find his place, maybe it is the best place for him. Matt and his little sister are hiding, having gotten separated from their parents. The putties attack, and he tells his sister, whose name just so happens to be Kira, by the way, to run. He turns to the putties and reveals himself, sending them to go help Goldar. Zack shows up, asking if he's okay. He says he's fine, the Black Ranger here must have scared them off. Zack looks as unsure as you can through a helmet and tells him to get to safety. The four rangers get Goldar surrounded, but then Billy teleports in, in a perfect position for Goldar to grab him and hold him hostage. He threatens to take his head off when headlights shine through, and Matt smacks into Goldar with a minivan, apologizing inside of it where nobody can hear. The rangers head back to Goldar, but he retreats. The rangers ask where Billy was, but he won't say, keeping that private, just apologizing for showing up late. Trini says that they teleport in together for safety, and by coming alone, he endangered himself. He says the sword that was at his throat makes him painfully aware of that. Kimberly changes the subject, furious that Matt was targeted yet again, feeling it's because he's associated with the Rangers. She's frustrated that their friends and family are in danger, but they can't tell them why. Zordon doesn't reference the rules this time, just pointing out that the more those people know, the more danger they're in. Rita will not suffice for just hurting them, she will use them against the rangers. Speaking of which, Squat and Babu attempt to feed Matt, but he kicks the plate aside, saying if Rita wants him to eat, she can come feed him herself. The two of them leave, and Matt sees a fork near his foot. The rangers are having a smoothie with Matt, the fake Matt, talking about his crazy exploits with hitting Goldar with a car and everything. Rita contacts him telepathically and says they need to talk. He steps outside, saying he knows it looked like he betrayed Goldar, but he could tell that Zack suspected him and he needed to do something to earn their trust again. Rita says the plan was to make Matt a victim, adding that why can't we tell them stress that Kim mentioned earlier. He says that the rangers respond well to bravery, and while Goldar could have killed one ranger, he can get her all five. She gives him the classic undercover agent speech, telling him to remember who he works for. At the football game, quarterback Matt is lighting things up. Watching the game, Zack asks Trini an ominous question, raising his suspicions about Matt. He tells Trini how he saw the putties attacking Matt, but he just said something and then they all left. Also, Matt has been using weird words, remembering things in an odd way, etc. Trini asks if they should tell Kim, but he says not until they're sure. Outside the stadium, and perhaps later since we see these two in the stadium, Bulk and Skull are asking a girl to the dance. She's in a little bit more of a charitable mood. Her and a friend of hers weren't planning to go anyway, so you know, dinner, corsages, treated like royalty, and they can make with one slow dance, hands where we can see them. After the game, Matt is raving to Kim about how he did, kind of speaking about football like it's something he's never actually played before. She doesn't really notice and moves in to kiss him, but he backs away, nervous, saying he's got to get back to the locker room. Billy shows up, Kim pointing out that he missed the entire game. He says he's been doing a lot of thinking. She's been annoyed that Matt is constantly in danger, and he worries about holding the team back. His solution? 
Matt should become the new Blue Ranger. Issue 6 was kind of on par with Issue 5, extending the setup of things just a little bit more. The only real action sequence came with Goldar and the putties at the drive-in, and even that was slower and focused more on the intrigue than the actual action itself. Jason's lead-in last time with the whole being tougher on the team and not being their friend as much didn't really go anywhere this time, seeing as we focus more on Matt's deception of the Rangers. And we also deal with Billy's issues with his potential Promethea internship. It was a good story setup, it was just really quiet. Issue number six gets a 3.5 out of 5. Next time on a comically long review, can Matt accomplish Rita's goals before the Rangers figure him out? Or will they accidentally add an enemy to their team in the meantime? Find out in a shorter video, the last comically long review before we get to Shattered Grid, as I take a look at Go Go Power Rangers, issues number 7 and 8. That is going to wrap up another comically long review. Thank you, heroes, so much as always for watching. In the comments below, let me know what you thought of these issues, as well as my review of them. And while you're down there, make sure to smack the thumbs up button and let me know that you enjoyed this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel to see all of my videos and ring the bell. Get your notifications set up so you're notified whenever I post brand new videos like these comically long reviews. And if you'd like to support the channel financially, there are two ways that you can lend that support. Head over to ko-fi.com slash videos. You can buy me a coffee set at $3 and buy as many of those as you would like. I greatly appreciate those because I really like coffee. Or if you'd like to donate less or a different amount, head on over to digitaltipjar.com slash orangerangervid and there you can donate whatever amount you would like. I greatly appreciate anything I find at either of those sites. Until next time, heroes, may the power protect you. Last time, these brand new Mighty Morphin Power Rangers were first dealing with the problem of not knowing words. The regular cover, which is this was farts. Four months after arrival day, Kim is having dinner with her parents at a really, uh, four months after arrival day? Back to the present, page Kim would love to leave the corpse of, on the... Doing this would be con... Listen, I get that that sounds <coughs> terrible with my throat. Listen, I get that that sounds, and I don't want to say that bad. Noted that's... Talking about how they will spread fear, so words... <coughs> Rita is concerned that the shapeshifter... Shapeshifter, sister, fifter, pifter. Issue number five gets a 4.5, gets a five, gets a four, gets a 1144. I'm gonna split that and do the score. They discuss her, a wallflower looking girl who is in, as in. They discuss her, a wallflower looking girl who is as. who is. So it made him painfully aware of that situation. Zordon doesn't reference the rules this time, just pointing out that the more that their friends and family, friends and Rita says that <coughs> <coughs> Matt should become the new Blue Ranger.